Today's episode is brought to you by Path 11 TV, inspiring entertainment for the spiritually curious. With a Path 11 TV membership, you get instant access to over 100 hours of exclusive video content that explores consciousness, healing, and life after death. Also with the Path 11 TV membership, you can attend our monthly events and live streams free. In the past few months, we've already had medium readings with Drew Callie and Suzanne Northrup, along with a numerology session with Nicene Siegel, and Chinese face readings with Marla Goldberg. Join us for our next event, July 21st, for another gallery reading, this time with medium Mark Schmidt. You can start your Path 11 TV membership for just $9.99 a month, or get two months free by getting an annual membership. Podcast listeners can save even more by using coupon code PODCAST30. This will take 30% off, making your first year only $70. That's only 20 cents a day. Don't hesitate because this offer is only good for a limited time. All membership plans have a seven-day free trial. So start streaming with your membership to Path 11 TV today by visiting path11tv.com and start satisfying your spiritual curiosity with our exclusive library of inspiring entertainment. Now let's get to today's show. Hi, and thanks for tuning in to the Path 11 podcast. I am your host, April Hanna. At the Path 11 Podcast, we are here trying to deliver leading-edge research on consciousness, healing, and metaphysics. And just like you, we are trying to answer the big questions about life. Who are we? Why are we here? And what is our purpose? We hope by listening to our podcast, it will make each day you live on Earth a little easier to understand. And now for today's podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's show. We have a second time guest on the Path 11 podcast today. This guest, Matthew McKay, was actually on the podcast when we first started. He's episode 52. And in that episode, he had written a book called Seeking Jordan. And we really covered a lot about the compelling evidence of life after death after he lost his son through a tragic accident. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. His son's name is Jordan. And since then, since Jordan's passing or transition, I should say, he has been communicating with his father, with our guest, Matthew. And they have written books together. And we are going to be talking about the most recent book, The Luminous Landscape of the Afterlife. So for those of you who are watching on Path 11 TV, you can see this beautiful cover of this book. Let me tell you a little bit more about Matthew. He is a Ph.D., clinical psychologist, professor of psychology at the Wright Institute, co-founder of Haight-Ashbury Psychological Services, founder of the Berkeley CBT Clinic, and co-founder of the Bay Area Trauma Recovery Clinic, which serves low-income clients. He's authored and co-authored more than 40 books, and this is a funny story. Have one of his books, I didn't even realize this was him until now, The Relaxation and Trust reduction workbook. If you've ever worked with a therapist, you've probably seen this book and I have it on my my bookshelf. I ran to get it to really check if his name was on there and it sure was. I've run so many therapy groups out of this. It's been a great gift. I'm also the author of Seeking Jordan and then his newest book, The Luminous Landscape of the Afterlife. This is his son's messages to the living on what to expect after death And it's kind of Jordan's book of the dead. He's giving us instructions, channeling through his father on how we can prepare for our own death. This book is loaded. There's no way I'm going to be able to get through everything that I want to, but I'm hoping you guys really enjoy this conversation today. So Matthew, welcome back to the Path 11 podcast. Glad to be with you. Yeah. Let's just bring my listeners up to speed in case they haven't gone back to the archives and listened to episode 52. It might be great to put this episode on pause, go back and listen to that because it really gives more of the full, fuller story, which I'd like you to just touch upon a little bit of how what happened to Jordan, his passing, the channeling. But I really have so much to get into with this book that we won't recap all of that, but highly recommend people listen to episode 52. And I know that you were not really a skeptic, but this wasn't like an area that you were really into at all before Jordan's passing. So can you tell our listeners what had happened? 13 years ago, uh, Jordan was on his way home from work, riding a bicycle and some men accosted him probably to try to take his bicycle and there's a huge fight. He broke away and 
one of them shot him in the back. He, he died there on the street. And as anyone, I think any parent would feel on losing a child, there's this enormous sense of this feeling of, it is my child, does my child still exist? Is there, are they okay? Wherever they are, are they okay? And I just had that enormous need to know, was Jordan, does soul still exist? So I, I set out to find him. You know, there were a lot of different things I did. I, I went to mediums. I eventually did something called induced after death communication with Alan Botkin, who used variant of EMDR that he discovered accidentally that apparently opens the channel to those on the other side. And I go to see Botkin in Chicago. I had the experience of hearing Jordan, hearing his voice, telling me the things that I needed to know that he was okay. He was still with us. He loved us. So that was tremendously important. It began to lighten my grief somewhat, but I still had this tremendous need to have a conversation with Jordan, not just passively have a medium tell me something that he was supposedly saying. Uh, and certainly I was very grateful for the experience I had with Bodkin of, of the actually hearing his voice, but still I wanted to be able to communicate and have a conversation. And so I went to see the late Ralph Metzner who taught me how to do channel communication. And it was not a very hard thing to do. It turns out you don't need any special qualities. You don't, I'm not clear audient. I am not psychic, but I am able to do channel communication. And, and when he taught me how to do it that night, I went home and I had my first conversation with Jordan since he had passed. And since then we've had hundreds and hundreds of conversations on several occasions. He's told me that he wants to write a book and in the, the book, The Luminous Landscape of the Afterlife, he suggested that we needed to write a book. I think he outlined it in about five minutes, exactly what was going to be in the, the entire book, very clear to him what he wanted to do. And he said, there's no person more qualified to talk about death and the afterlife than someone who's died and lives in the afterlife. And, and he, so he wanted to convey to people still living what, what it's, what the afterlife really, what that experience is, but also how to prepare for it. And he, he also was, is very concerned about how much we fear death. Certainly I fear, I've feared death most of my life until I started really talking to Jordan and learning about the afterlife. I really have had a, a very strong and disturbing fear of death. And Jordan is aware that most people do. And so he wanted to write a book that would help people with that fear of death, prepare them, not just for death, but for how to, how to, you know, the early stages of the afterlife, what's there, how to navigate, how to deal with it. And, and most importantly, how to communicate in the afterlife because communication in the afterlife is entirely dependent on the experience of love. And so if we arrive in the afterlife with very little sense of love, we're, he says we're DOA, we're deaf on arrival. And so pre preparing for the afterlife really is preparing with love. And so let me ask you a question just for other parents who might be listening to this podcast who have lost a child. With your communication with Jordan and a lot of communication, and now you guys have written two books together, has your connection with him in spirit shifted the grief in any way? Or would you say as a parent, there's always still this longing? to wish that, that they were here? Or has this work created a different sort of peace that maybe not all parents are able to feel or experience because they're not channeling their child? The answer is yes to all of those things. I guess the ability to talk to Jordan and, and the amazing things that he's revealed to me about the afterlife and even about his own existence. He's reincarnated again. He's a little girl. And, and yet part of his spirit remains in the afterlife and can communicate with me. The, those experiences with him have definitely changed my sense of grief. I feel like he's with me. I have been lost him and he's with me. I, he's really just a thought away. In fact, all of our loved ones on the other side are just a thought away. And when you think of them, you begin to open the channel. And so I have this sense that he's always with me and his love surrounds me and he guides me and he supports me and helps me face things, difficult challenges in my life. So the, the grief has changed, 
in that way. I, I, his presence is a very powerful influence in my life. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, I do m- miss him. I miss the, my son, Jordan, the, uh, 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 as he was physically in this world, in my life, I miss hugging him. I miss the, the, ex- the experience of seeing him sitting across uh, the kitchen and being in a, one of our conversations. And there's so much that I have lost that I, I do feel grief about, but I haven't lost him. He is still with me. And so that, that changes the grief. And I've taught many people how to channel people they love who have passed and are on the other side. And it does, the ability to channel and communicate does change grief. It, it lightens it for sure. Great. I think that's important for some people to hear. I feel like Jordan asked me to ask that question as well. So thanks, Jordan. We, we might be channeling him together in this, in this, in this talk today. And I sure, think, true. yeah, I, and I'm going to be jumping around because this was actually going to be later of one of the questions that I was asking, but we're getting nudged to talk about it right now. He really covers in this book, the reasons why we are drawn back to reincarnate back into the physical. And I think for some of those reasons that you talked about, the ability to touch, to conversate, to see him, and I have it earmarked here on page 94, like the the lure of the physical life, he says, includes the physical sensations that aren't available in spirit, that we can remember the warts of the sun, experiencing the pleasure of our senses that they don't experience in spirit, sexual desire, hunger, touching and holding, curiosity, discovery, caretaking of children, of those in need and service, risk and adventure. The list goes on. And as I was reading the list, I was like, oh yeah, yep. That's that's why I always say too, like the colors here are fabulous and the food. It's, I know that we can't really experience that in spirit. And one of the things that I really love that I highlighted is that Jordan said, the essential truth driving us to incarnate is that soul's hunger for growth. There are things we cannot discover in the afterlife that we can discover here in the physical life. And I thought that was really well said. What are some of your thoughts about that? Yeah, Jordan has really emphasized to me that the reason souls exist is to learn, and that that we are essentially, our raison d'etre is learning, growing, developing, evolving. And we come to earth and we can, there are a lot of planets that souls incarnate to, but we come to uh, physical places because there's forms of learning here that are not available in the afterlife. If, for example, in the afterlife, everything is love. We communicate through the, the medium of love. Uh, we're surrounded by love. We're held by love. And it's, it's a palpable experience that is always with us. In a physical existence, we have it's loving is hard work. There are all kinds of, there's all kinds of pain that gets in the way of love. Just an example, the parent comes home from work, they're exhausted, they've had a bad day, and their child needs some attention from them. This, this child is upset about something. It's very difficult for that parent at that moment to, w- with exhaustion, with the painful mood that they're in, to somehow extend themselves in love to that child. So. Those kinds of, and learning how to do that, learning how to love in the face of pain is one of our primary tasks here. And, and we do it in all kinds of, we're constantly uh, facing that. We're, we're constantly trying to uh, figure out how can I express love in this relationship when I'm hurting? How can I express love when the other person is mad at me and I'm protecting myself, defending myself from, from rejection or hurt? How can I still how can I still bring love to this relationship? These are, and that's, those struggles don't exist in the afterlife. And so we come here primarily to learn how to love in the face of struggle, of, of difficulty and, and of pain. And, and that is our work. And we also have individual lesson plans that we're, we're working on developing ourselves as souls and in, in very particular ways, but overarching and over all of that is the task of learning how to love when we yeah. do all of that. Yeah, that was a good, you know, takeaway. And also I think what was, what I also took away from that too is it's not even so much about 
who we are, or what we do, like you and I are therapists and we're of service, which is great. But what's more important is the connections and the way that we love as opposed to, okay, I'm going to write five books. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. That's not the importance of it. It's really more about how we can become more loving, have connections with other human beings and kind of work through those trials and tribulations, like you said, with the most amount of love that we can. Yeah. All right. So couple of things here. Let's start off too with Susan Eastman, Geisman. Did I pronounce it? She was on our show too. Sometimes I pronounce her last name wrong. She wrote the forward for the book and you also talk about it too. And so let's get this out of the way that where some skeptics might be like, maybe Matthew just made all of this up or some of this could be from his own research. Like maybe you read the Tibet, Tibetan Book of the Dead and a couple of other resources and you are interpreting what you think the afterlife might be like through the connection of Jordan, but you're very specific and you touch upon this in the book too, about how you're really able to distinguish the difference between Jordan channeling your own thoughts and your voice and that this is truly a channeled book from yourself. There's some some ways that's become very clear to me. First is that Jordan is saying things that I've never thought of. These are ideas and concepts that have never entered my mind that I am hearing from him for the first time. So the thoughts are original and not my own. So I, that, that's the, the first thing that's just very compelling to me. The language is not my own. Jordan s- s- has his own way of speaking, his own way of communicating, his own use of language that is not at all like mine. And the other thing is that a number of mediums have confirmed what Jordan is doing. For example, mediums who didn't know anything, didn't know me, didn't know Jordan, have confirmed to other people that Jordan is writing a book with me and, and he has, and he has come through them and expressed various kinds of key information that corroborates all that he, what he's been doing with me. We have a lot of evidence from other people, from, from mediums and other people who've had, Jordan has actually shown up and communicated vital things to them, all of these things corroborating what he's been writing and, and communicating to me. So it, 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 there is an authenticity here that it's not just words appearing in my mind that could be my own. This is a distinct entity that is showing up. Also, I feel different physically when I'm, I'm channeling Jordan. I have uh, physical sensations that, are, that go from my scalp all the way down my spine that I, I, my body is altered by the experience of channeling in ways that's very compelling to me. Yeah. And I know that they've been doing some research too. It's the place out in California. Is it INAX? I get INS and INAX kind of confused sometimes of where I think that they have actually done some studies and have been able to see like either changes in the brain or some sort of chemistry that's changing when people are channeling, that something physiologically really is happening within the body when somebody's channeling. There's some really interesting research that the uh, Institute of Noetic Sciences is doing on channel, channeling and channel communication. And, and I can verify my own experiences that my body uh, feels different when the channel opens. Yeah. All right. So I want to talk about a very interesting subject, the Bardos here, okay, in the book. Gosh, Jordan went through so much stuff of like different type of personalities of humans, like people who are fearful of death, who are afraid, who are holding on to feelings of shame or guilt, people who have inflicted harm, hate, violence, people maybe who are lost or when they transition through a tragic accident or maybe they're having some sort of, you know, what we might call a psychosis or they're not in the fully functioning mind at the time of death and kind of what this looks like in the healing place and then what the Bardos is. So before I share a little bit of an experience and a story as I was reading this book that shocked me, I want you to explain to our listeners, what does Jordan mean by the healing place and also the Bardo? So we can set the stage for a story that I'm going to share with you and get your input on. Shortly after death, we arrived at what Jordan calls the landing place, which is just adjacent to the spirit world. Uh, And it's a place that's sort of prepared for us to calm us, to help us get used to being disembodied and no nervous system, not no longer using our legs and walking and all, all the things that have changed. We go to the landing place to get used to and welcomed by guides to help us with this transition. 
However, some people arrive at the landing place and they are not ready to enter the spirit world. As you were describing, they are carrying intense emotions within their anger, fear, and they are, or, or they don't even know they're dead and they're confused. Some of them have some expectation of an afterlife that is nothing like what is actually there. And they're uh, hallucinating that and they're expecting some kind of judgmental, angry God and, and there is no such thing. And so for a variety of reasons, they arrive at the landing place unprepared to enter the spirit world. They, they don't, and they're, we talked about this a minute ago, they're deaf on arrival. They, they don't have they don't have very much access to love inside of them. So they can't really hear anything that's being told to them. They, all of the telepathic communications come via love and they're deaf to that. So they are just not ready to enter the spirit world. And so they may go to the healing place, which is Jordan describes it. If you had a picture of it, it would be like a big open air hospital where people are, are souls are lying and sleeping and being administered to by guys. Now that's not actually what it is, but you could picture it as something like that. And, and in the healing place, guides are remodeling the this, this soul energy. They are actually, because our, our soul energy can get, get, get damaged in our lives. And particularly if we're doing evil or hurtful things to others, that damages our soul energy. If we are victims of incredible uh, pain and hurt, that can damage our soul energy. And so there's a lot of work to heal the soul energy in, in that place. Now, it's also true that some souls then enter bardas, which are special existences. They actually, in many cases, look like physical existence where, where souls play out scenarios and themes that, that they have to work through in their lives. For example, a soul that is experiences a lot of hurt and damage and a soul that lives in a Casca F esque world in which they're feeling hurt and, and betrayed and, and damaged by others. They may go to a special border where they play out some of those themes and the action. And these are all then carefully orchestrated by guides so that the soul gradually resolves these themes, these scenarios, and these stories, and gets ready to finally enter the spirit world. So bardos are places of learning. It's not, we're not banished there. We're not sent to bardos to suffer. No, and, and that's one of the things that the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the, the, the bardos there are really, they don't exist in, in the actual spirit world. But the, the bardos in the spirit world are all about healing, learning, recovering, from damaging experiences in one's life. Okay, so this is where I don't even know what to believe, <laughs> if I should have a belief system or reading this very openly, because I would say I've heard before, read, listened to other people that either have had experiences, channeled, have near-death experiences, have seen the light. I've heard some people come back to say that there's no such things as trapped souls. There's no such thing as lost souls that they just, I don't know if that's a belief system or what they experience or what they saw. And so I was like, that's interesting because I've also talked to so many people where it sounds like depending upon the way that people died or like what you're talking about, some other experiences are set up in the spirit world in order for them to reflect. You talk, Jordan talks about it in the book about, you know, doing a life review. That seems to be common no matter what. There's a life review that happens and you're brought through some things with your guides to reflect and to learn on that. And then I've talked to some people that say, no, this concept of lost souls and people are trapped and if they commit suicide, that they're stuck there. That's not true, that people just make their transitions. I've heard both sides, but my experience comes in and what I wanted to share with you with what something that Jordan touched upon that I felt very validated was in 2019, my mom was killed and she was killed by a car. So she was crossing the street late at night and a driver had hit her. And she was not sober at the time. She had pretty high levels of alcohol in her body. And after she transitioned, I tried to find her and to connect with her. And I began having these experiences like she was still like pissed off and she was still drunk when I was connecting with her. And I saw her at a bar and I was like, mom, what are you doing? Come on, like enough is enough. And she had said to me, I, there's no side effects here. I can drink as much as I want, as long as I want. And she was reveling in spirit form and the fact that she could just sit here. And in a sense, from what I understand, it's not like she was probably enjoying a drink, 
but something in this reality or maybe this bardo that she was in, there was this relief of not having to detox or to get sick from the alcohol. And she was like pissed that she was gone and still wanted to do her drinking. And I remember sharing that with a medium that was doing a reading for me and we were talking and it was, that doesn't make any sense, April. Like, why would she drink if she can't experience what a drink is in this thing? So like my experience and what I felt was negated by maybe the belief system that this medium had held and just felt like maybe that wasn't true or again. But when I was reading parts of the Bardo and then I had a dream later after where I was helping my mom detox in spirit and saw her going through all the symptoms, her body changed. It was a little bit of a nightmare. It was a little scary and wacky and felt like a like an exorcism that was happening in my dream. And then shortly after that, I had gotten another reading and this medium had validated. She said, I feel like your mom is in rehab right now in the spirit world. And I was like, Yes, I know that she is. I just helped her detox in a dream. Yes, that makes sense. So I felt very validated in reading some of the experiences that Jordan talks about how some people, again, my mom's was a tragic accident. That wasn't a very fun way to go. But again, I've had alter, I've had a lot of different feedback from some other people because now I'm investigating, right? What really happens? Was she lost? Was she stuck? Was she not? And I had many people say who could channel and could do mediumship to say, oh, her transition was very easy. She, there, there was no problem whatsoever. And I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, but that, why is that not my experience when I tap into her and see where she is? I felt something so different. And I didn't know, are they just saying that to bring you comfort, to make you feel like, oh, even though she was hit by a car, like she's okay. I'm like, I don't think she is. I think she's going through something right now before she can actually get into a better place. And as time has gone by and I check in with her and I communicate with her, she's much healthier now. And I could see that she has transcended a bit and is in a totally different place in the spirit world. Reading about how people go come to these bardos and might be shown different things or living things out was very validating for me in my experience of connecting with my mom and spirit soon after, immediately after she was killed. And then a year and a half later, it feels so different. So I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Oh my goodness. I have so many thoughts. First of all, th this idea, uh, this qu question about do people get stuck somewhere? It's not about being stuck in a bardo it's, or banished in a bardo. You're, si you're simply there for a while as part of a, your learning journey. It's not, and you will get, you know, almost every case you are, you do get to the spirit world, you return to your soul group. It's, 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 it's not a place where, where you're left to, to suffer and be punished. But there are bardos that help us transition and prepare for entering the spirit world. And for, for example, one of the things that makes it very hard to get into the spirit world in, in initially is addiction, because you, your life is all about the substance that you're, you're addicted to. Your life and your mind is largely controlled by the craving and seeking of that substance. And, the, and so we get to the landing place and, and we're still struggling with that. We don't have a body anymore, but, but we're struggling with the residuals of, of addiction. And so it, it's quite likely that your mom would have gone to a bardo where she is working with addiction. And for example, what you describe is exactly what Jordan has described, where we, we, at times we go to bars that have, that that are physical. We actually have bodies and we, and we interact with the, with a certain experience that's been created for us in that part of, in the, in this case, a bar, but our bodies can't be hurt. That's the difference. So we actually do have a physical body, but it does, it can't be damaged. And so she, it's exactly what you described. She could drink and she doesn't have any after effects of it, but she's learning about the addiction in this, in this place. And it's been created for her to, to, to come to terms with the addiction and to actually overcome it in some fashion. And she can enter the spirit world as soon as she's resolved addiction to, to a level that she can make, get actually experience love. One of the problems with addiction is it blocks love. You, your life and your attention and your focus is all about the substance and getting the substance. And you don't have much room for, I, I used to work in a, in a de detox uh, facility and people would describe to me when I'm, at, when I'm addicted, well, my values get completely inverted. All the things I love fall to the bottom that the heat and getting heroin or whatever it is, is the most important thing to me and everything else it, it drops away. And that's what happens. It's, so actually the healing 
And what she was doing in that bardo was was turning that back around so that love is on top and the con- and the concern about her particular substance of alcohol dropped to the bottom and she lost her desire and interest in it. That's what she was doing there. Yeah. And that was my sense too. I felt like she stayed there for a while until it got boring. There wasn't anything else. And there was this realization like, okay, there's nothing left here. Okay. Why am I still doing this? And then she was ready to to, to go and get detoxed in the spirit world, I guess. And this, and this environment was created by guys for her to have that experience and for her to learn exactly what you just described. Yeah. So I feel so much less crazy now that I've read this book because that experience that I had connecting with her was so real. I could draw the bar. I could tell you what the bar looked like. It It was real as if you and I are talking right now. And I really felt like, There was a part of me that felt like, okay, is my consciousness creating this scenario based on prior experiences that I had with my mother? So is this really the imagination at play creating this because maybe there's a part of my unconscious that feels like she's stuck or she's still struggling with addiction because she died addicted? So that's the struggle that I sometimes have. How much of this am I either making up in my head or this is what I'm needing to see to work it out in my own unconscious? Or am I really having this experience with my mother in in this ethereal spirit world that we can't see, that we can see in a different way? And I'm really tapping into exactly what Jordan wrote about. So You are. I think you did. And another reason why that seems, your experience seems true and real to me is, is because you're describing this dream in a way that Jordan talks about the difference between dreams and visitations. When we have visitations in our sleep, it has a super vivid, super real quality to it that you were just describing. It, it, and the vividness and the intensity of it and the power of the interaction with, that, with the spirit on the other side are unlike normal dreaming. And so th- that again tells me that there's something very real about what you experienced. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. One of them was the dream when she was detoxing, which was more of a nightmare. And the other one where I saw her at the bar, it was more just in meditation. I was lucid. I was aware and just, I might've even been walking when I was doing it and just setting the intention to say, Hey, where are you, mom? What are you doing? And then all of a sudden I had this whole scene play out in in front of me in my mind's eye of where she was and her attitude and she was pissed and got into an argument and I was like all right peace out do it do whatever you're doing there and just felt a little strange and then tried to shared it for the first time with somebody with a medium and got shot down about it and never spoke of it since until now because I really felt validated by what I read in this book and the other thing that I really loved that Jordan outlines very clearly is that there really is no evil That really, when people may experience things that feel frightening or scary or evil or feel like that they're in hell, is more of the projection of the fear and the energy, like you say, that they're carrying from life, their own fears, maybe some of their own belief systems that kind of appear or get manifested when they transition. But it's not that there are like these evil entities or these evil spirits. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, there is no hell. There are no evil spirits. There are souls that are confused and sometimes don't leave the physical plane for a while. They're, they're, they're hanging around their body and so forth. And we call those ghosts and and there's souls that do, it takes them a while to recognize that they're dead or be ready to leave the physical uh, scene that is they're familiar with, but there is no hell in the afterlife. Uh, There's no punishment and souls, no matter what they did, no matter what hurtful or harmful things they may have done no matter what pain they may have caused others, they're not judged as good or bad. There is no judgment. They simply are, on entering the afterlife and the spirit world, souls are just about learning what they did and how it affected others. For example, you mentioned the process of life review. Usually that's the first stop in the spirit world. Once we leave the landing place and we actually enter the spirit world proper, the very first thing we do is life review, and a life review is almost every soul does this very early on. And it can be a very arduous process because in the life review, we not only look at what we, every single choice we made, every single action from our own point of view, but we experience it as others experience it. So 
if we did something that was hurtful or painful or caused painful emotions to others, we experienced that as they did. And not only at the moment of the choice that we made, but we actually experienced how it affected them over time, other people over time. So for example, if a father slaps his child in the life review, he's going to experience that slap as his child experienced it, but not just the, the slap itself and the feeling of rejection and hurt and fear, but also over time, how that child may come to see themselves uh, that may, they may be judging themselves and uh, seeing themselves as bad and wrong and have self-hate from all of the, 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 ch the hurtful choices that the dad made. And now the, the dad has to experience that all over time. So it's not just the slap, but it's the effect and the effect over time. So that there's a very profound experience. And, and frankly, there are some souls, Jordan says, who've done such uh, painful things in the world that they're not willing to face life review. They just can't bear the, the, the prospect of experiencing all the pain that they've inflicted. And, and so they may stay in the anti-world. They, they're not in hell, but they, they stay adjacent to the spirit world, but can't really enter because they don't go, they won't go through the process of life review. So that's a really crucial part of what we do early on. Yeah, just fascinating stuff to read. The other thing that I was, oh, I want to read this, but maybe I don't want to read this was when Jordan was telling us how to prepare for our own death. <laughs> and I was like, okay, this feels a little scary. It was also intriguing and like helpful at the same time where he's followed the love and try to let go and try not to produce images in your mind. And it gives like the step-by-step -step when you're ready to leave your body that these are some experiences that you may have in spirit. I don't think I've ever seen anything in print like this before. Uh, even like a lot of the near-death experience people that will give accounts, uh, like this really felt like it was a manual on, okay, if you're going to die, this is how you want to do it. These are some things to think about. And as we read this as the reader, this is planting seeds in our own consciousness that I was like, okay, I'm going to read this because maybe at the time of my death, I'm going to remember what Jordan said. And I'm going to take these tools so that my transition can be made a little bit easier. Would you like to highlight a little bit of this process that Jordan teaches in this book? Yeah. What, what the most important thing he teaches is that we prepare for death with love. And when, as we approach death, we need to be expecting to encounter love on the other side. We need to expect to encounter certain souls who will be waiting for us with love. Expect to encounter guides who will hold us and, and support us with love. So part of preparing for death is just tuning into love, being aware of love, thinking about all the people that we love, thinking about the people on the other side that we love and expect and expecting to uh, reunite because it's love that will help us in the transition because again, it's through love that we listen and hear at all communications in the afterlife. One of the things that happens to a lot of souls who arrive in the landing place is that what is they hallucinate things that scare them because one of the things that happens in the afterlife is that whatever you is in your mind can come in an energy form that you project and actually experience in front of you. When Jordan f first arrived in the landing place, for example, he was hallucinating his home and where, and, and where he, where he lived. And then he was hallucinating Yosemite. He, he tried to calm himself and think about something that was beautiful. So he started thinking about Yosemite Valley, which he, lo which he loves. And then and then he started thinking about elephants. He could see elephants in Yosemite Valley and it, it, that made no sense. And, and, and then he was, the, and then the elephant made him think of, of a Godzilla type monster. And now he's got the elephant and Godzilla and everything is crazy. And he's hallucinating all this stuff. And this is what happens to souls. They get into the, into that landing place. And if they're, if they're scared and they're thinking about scary things, they will literally see that and get very confused. And so in order to, so part of getting ready for our transition is expecting that without a body, what we think about can actually project and be seen. We, we can create that image in front of us and to, and instead focus on listening for love. That's the entire, uh, our entire attention after death is on where is the love, listening for it, waiting to hear, telepathically get communication and being passive about not creating images in our mind, not visualizing things and then seeing them in front of us, but rather waiting for the guides to show us something that they will create something for us. The landing place is created for us to be calm and, and peaceful and, and to make the transition. 
they will provide images. So for us not to expect something and visualize it and get confused and hallucinated, guides will help us. And all of our job is just to listen for love. Very helpful. This is a helpful guide. If this is a great book. I'm hoping to use this. I run a spiritual self-help book club and I usually choose authors from the Path 11 podcast and would love to invite you back to do a little Q&A when um, I review this with the, the book club that I have. They're just like a bunch of really fantastic people who are on this journey and they are going to eat this book up. So I took a break off for the summer. I'm going to re restart it again in the fall, but I think we're going to choose your book, yours and Jordan's book to, to review because this is just, it's heavy stuff, but it's really good. And it also, I think what I really love, it's always a good reminder. When I, every time I think about the life review that I'm going to have, it makes me want to be that much better of a person. So when I'm reviewing and looking, it's like, God, I just want to do the least amount of damage that I could do to other human beings and really come at life with kindness and maybe be stuck in a really nice, fun bardo <laughs> so, until I have to get wherever I'm going. So this was phenomenal. This was great. I'm, I'm so glad that you're channeling Jordan and you're doing the work here. Really enjoyed it. So can you let people know where they can find this wonderful guidebook and how they can get in touch with you the the book is amazon and Barnes and noble and anywhere books are sold if, it, if somebody wants to learn more about jordan or read more of what he has to say you can go to www.seekingjordan.com and in the, in the meantime i just want to encourage everyone in preparing for transition for preparing for death in the afterlife is a simple meditation where you just breathe in love and breathe out fear breathe in love breathe out fear and that is one of the best preparations you can make for uh trans transitioning breathe in love breathe out fear and and just to remember that all the people you love who are on the other side are waiting for you and those relationships are always there always waiting always able to make contact with you they're just a thought of it it's a beautiful place to end. Thank you so much, Matthew, for being a guest again. As always, we would love to have you back. Keep writing books. Keep coming on our podcast. And I hope you all enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And we will talk to you and see you next time. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in to today's show. If you haven't already, please subscribe and rate and review the Path 11 podcast in Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Also, this podcast is made possible by our sponsor, Path 11 TV. Visit path11tv.com to start a seven-day free trial and start streaming over 100 hours of exclusive video content on consciousness, healing, and life after death. That's path11tv.com and be sure to use coupon code podcast30 to take 30% off your annual membership. Start satisfying your spiritual curiosity with a membership to Path 11 TV today. Bye for now.